Pastor, author, speaker, and international statesman, Wale Babatunde's visionary leadership has spanned the decades. Over the years, he has preached all over the world, overseen many church plants, authored over 15 books, founded aid centers, and food banks. Pastor Wale spends time advising international governments and leaders. But now he wants to spend time with you. Come now on a powerful, life-changing journey as we trailblaze with Wale Babatunde. Prayer does shift things. Prayer is as vast as God. Prayer is powerful. Prayer will change things. Once prayer is left, crisis comes in. Once prayer is left, darkness takes over. We must return prayer into our schools. We must return prayer into our churches. We must return prayer into our homes. God wants us to come boldly. God wants us to argue our case. Esther prayed and God changed the national crisis. A whole nation was saved because of a woman's prayer. You know, I'm a student of history and I've studied a little bit about the history of, 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 of Great Britain because we, we are a land of revival. You know, in the 18th century, I believe it is in uh, 1735, there was a revival in Wales. You know, it was bad out of prayer. It was bad out of, out of intercession, talking to the Lord several hours. The same thing in 1904. There was a revival in Wales and it was said that in Loco, in, in South Wales, for two years, you know, they did not have to invite in a policeman because God had showed up in Loco. But you know the key? The key, one of the greatest instruments of that revival was a young man called Evan Roberts. If you look at the story of Evan Roberts, Evan Roberts was a man that always spoke to God. History tells us that between the hours of one till about five in the morning, one till about five in the morning, every single day, he said he entered into communion with God. He wrestled with God. And as a result of this man's prayer, God gave Wales revival. Remember, he said, I look for a man. I am looking. I am looking for him that will mind the gap. <laughs> a man that will stand in the gap. He says, I found not. Maybe the reason why we are not experiencing revival today is because we're not standing in the gap enough. You know, we're not standing. And the Bible speaks. The book of James that we started with it says, Elijah was a man of like passion. Elijah was a man of like passion. In other words, Elijah was a man like you and myself. He was frail, he had weaknesses, but he prayed, he prayed. And things happened during his time. You know, God changed, God changed the life of um, Ezekiah because he was willing to pray. Let me tell you something. I have seen a number of testimonies of people who the doctor said that uh, they couldn't have a child. I've had testimonies, we've experienced testimonies in our ministry here in the UK and abroad where I've gone to, I've gone to preach. The key is always prayer. Maybe you've been called barren. Your story can change. You can become the mother of children if you will take, take uh, your case before God. Don't ever believe that nothing, uh, there's something that is uh, impossible. No, the Bible says with God, all things are possible. God wants you to ask and keep asking until your joy before. There was a woman in the Bible. I'm sure you know the story very well in the book of First Samuel. First Samuel, her name was Hannah. Hannah was married to El Elkanah and Elkanah had two wives. One was Penina. And the second was Anna. Bible says that Penina had children. She had children, but Anna had no, no child because her womb was shut. You know, you know, one thing I love about this story is the fact that the Bible says, I believe it's first, first um, Samuel chapter one, it speaks in verse number six. It says, and Penina provoked Anna. So on a daily basis, she provoked her. You know, I can imagine Penina will have composed songs, you know, talking about the barrenness of, of Hannah. And it provoked her, provoked Hannah so, such that Hannah refused to eat. Can I tell you something? Every one of us 
needs a provocator. Oh, you did not hear what I said. Let me repeat it. Every one of us needs a provocator. If you don't have one, pray for one. You know what provocators do? They provoke you not to settle down for the status quo. Provocators are people who will provoke you and send you on your knees. Provocators are people that will remind you of what you should have accomplished in life. That was the ministry of Mordecai. Mordecai had to tell Esther, Esther, you are not meant to sit down in this palace. There, there's a greater grace upon your life. There's a greater calling of God upon your life. You know, while Penina was hitting Hannah, she did not know she was pushing Anna into her destiny. She was pushing her to church. She was pushing her into her destiny. She will sing song. She will provoke Anna. And as a result, Anna will not eat. Anna will not drink. Let me tell you something. Many of you listening to me, you have been marking time for so many years. You have been marking times for decades. You know, people have been clapping for you that you are doing very well. No. You need encouragers from time to time, but you also need provocators. You know, in my life, when I hang around some men of God, they provoke me. You know, they provoke me. When they begin to give testimonies about what God has accomplished in their lives, when they begin to talk about what God is doing across the nation, while they are testifying, they are also provoking me. I love people who will wake up their husband and say, Honey, you know what? Uh, you know what? There's so much God has spoken about your life. You are a great man of God, you know, and uh, you are supposed to be accomplishing more. You are a city taker. You are a nation taker. Rather than pull down your husband, rather than pull down your wife, you need to provoke them. Bible says we should provoke one another to good works. They provoked Anna, and Anna went as it was her custom to the house of God in Shiloh. You know one thing, while everybody were drinking and where they were, you know, they were eating, she knew why she was there. You know one of the reasons why we are not getting what we need to get from God and we are not moving up the ladder and we are not fulfilling destiny is what I call weapons of mass distraction. Many of us are too distracted. Distracted by phone, distracted by social media, distracted by people, by friends, distracted by food and all kinds of things. It's because we don't mean business. Anna knew what she wanted. She negotiated with God. She pleaded her case. God was looking for a prophet. Anna was looking for a son. God is looking for negotiation. Bible says, you know, Samuel was the greatest prophet from Dan to Beersheba. You know, God was looking for a prophet that would speak his mind, that would start something new on the face of the earth. Anna was looking for a son. After negotiation, she said, you know what, God, if you give me a son, I'm going to give you back this prophet. All the days of his life, God said, I got you. You have exactly, you know, what you have said. Look at our nation, Great Britain. Great Britain was a nation that experienced the glory of God several times. You know, I've spoken in parliament several times. I've written in my books. You know, Great Britain has fallen away, Great Britain, and great men and women that made Britain great. You know, I've, I've highlighted in all those books the kind of revivals, what we have experienced in the past. And anytime I read the history of this nation, I become so jealous. No nation is like our nation. You know, I was sharing just yesterday, you know, at a conference in this nation, and I was sharing with them how that uh, most of our football clubs, of the 39 football clubs that started the premiership, I believe in 1992, one third of them were started in the church. Aston Villa Football Club was started around Birmingham area from Methodist Church. Oh, did you hear what I said? Aston Villa was started from the Methodist Church that was bad out of prayer. Tottenham Football Club was started in the church. Fuller Football Club was started in the church. Bansley Football Club was started in the church. So many of the football clubs that we, we now, you know, you know when the score people raise up their hands, it's to worship God. <laughs> it's to worship God. All these all this football clubs were started as a tool of social reformation. Manchester City was started by the daughter of a priest. Now it's been taken over. We've lost, we've lost our glory. 
this nation entered into a coronation oath with God, you know, and God, well, we decided that we were, we were going to adopt um, the Christian uh, religion as our national religion, protestant, protestant nation. That's why anybody that becomes the king or the queen in this country becomes the defender of the faith. This nation was the nation that took the gospel to the ends of the earth like no other nation. You know, we took the we took the Baptist, we took the Anglican, we took the Methodist all around the world. We started schools. I'm a beneficiary of some of these things. But look at what is happening right now. There is darkness, darkness all over this nation. You know, we have reversed the laws of God. You know, we, we raised people like William Wilberforce, all men, people who were involved in, 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 in social change in our nation. But what has occurred right now, we have turned the laws of God. You know, we've turned the laws of God. There is darkness in politics. There is darkness in the media. BBC, when it was founded in 1933, was dedicated by the first director general, Lord Reed. It was dedicated to Christ. It was dedicated to Christ. If you look all around us today, there is darkness everywhere. You know, I'm saying all this thing to provoke you to know where we have fallen. For you to know that it's not a committee meeting that we need. Today, we are almost possessed with committee meetings. If you want to change the carpet in the church, we need a committee meeting. If you want to buy a table, we need a committee meeting. If you want to raise a pastor's salary, we need a committee meeting. If you want to extend the building, we need a committee meeting. Everything we want to, we want to, we want to pray right now. We first of all need to debate it. We do not need more committee meetings. What we need is a prayer meeting. One of my, one of my mentors in the faith, um, he's going to be with the Lord right now, Leonard Ravenhill. He said this in his book, Why Revive Our Tires. He says, a church that is not praying is trained. A church that is not praying is strained. And a pastor that is not praying is plain. We need God back on the scene. We need the glory of God back on the scene. We want to see revival once again. Like we experienced at the Hebrides in Scotland in 1949. It was back out of prayer. All the Welsh revival was bad out of prayer. The revivals in America was bad out of prayer. In Nigeria, during the 1930s, we had a man called um, um, uh, Apostle uh, Joseph Ayobabalala, the founder of, of, of the Christ Apostolic Church. This man, this man tore the nation up. Uh, upside down this man shook kingdoms people powers of darkness were afraid of him why because the man was given to prayer if we're gonna change if things are gonna be shifted if things are gonna be lifted we must go back to prayer and uh, before I close let me let me share possibly one more one more experience in the book of first Kings chapter number 16 First Kings chapter number 16. Um, uh, it, it was a story when Israel was also, Israel had a national crisis, just as we have right now. There was moral crisis, there was spiritual crisis. It was during the time of one of the most wicked kings that ever ruled Israel. He was called Ahab, Ahab, King Ahab, Ahab. And Bible records that Ahab did more evil than any other king that had ruled before him. It was so bad. There was darkness in the land and gross darkness, uh, the people. That was the background. You know, there was King Ahab. He was a weak, weak and twisted leader. And has a, had a wife, Jezebel. And you know what? Israel started worshipping Baal. They were worshipping uh, a foreign god. People were no longer worshipping God. You know what? They had turned the laws of God, turned the commandments of God upside down. It was a nation that was ripe for judgment. But you know, I noticed something during this time. God did not give us anything about the man of God. No, no background story. He didn't go to any big theological seminar. He was not known on TV. He was not the son of a great prophet. He just showed up from nowhere he showed up you know who that man was Elijah the Bible does not tell us anything about him he just shows up you know what that tells me even at this hour where there is darkness all over this nation God has reserved for himself 
7,000 that has not bowed their knees. I call them the nameless and the faceless. They might have never been to a theological seminary. You might have not seen their faces on TV. But one thing is sure, God is preparing them behind the scene. Just like John the Baptist in the wilderness, waxing strong unto the day of his showing. Just like David, who is at the backside, God preparing him. Just like Moses, God preparing them. One thing is clear, this men and women, they know the voice of God. This men and women, they commune with God. This men and women will neither fear angels nor devils. Elijah showed up at a critical moment in the life of Israel. And you know what he said? In the book of uh, First Kings chapter number 17. I love what he said. He suddenly shows up one day. I believe it's from verse number one. He says, there shall not be rain or dew at my word. Wow, I love this. I checked it again. I said, well, what is this guy saying? Oh, he did not say at the word of God. You know, many times people say, thus saith the Lord. The Lord says, Elijah said, there shall not be rain or deal at my word. I love that. I want to see at this critical hour, prophet, genuine prophet of God, who will show their faces, you know, in the palace of Westminster. People who will show their faces at our TV station and say, at my word, there shall be no rain in this land for one year. So that you may know that you have gone against the word of the Lord. Let me tell you something. Initially, people might not take notice. But after six months and one year, people will take notice. Look at what he says in 1 Kings chapter 17 from verse number 1. And Elijah the chief Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain this year, but according to my word. I love that. You know what the man did? The man shut the heavens, locked up the heaven, and put the keys in his pocket. This is what we need now. We need the demonstration of the power of God. Away with all our philosophical speculation. Away with all the motivational speaking. Away with all kinds of prophecies that we give to people to tingle their ears. About the color of their pants and about the days. About the... Uh, about their bad day. Away with all those things. We don't need all those things right now. Prosperity preacher. We need the demonstration of the power of God. For the holy name of our God has been desecrated. The consecrated name of God has been desecrated by people in this nation. We need people that will raise up their voice. We need true prophets to arise. We need generals. We need people that will speak the mind of God. We need bold men. We don't need people who are going to hide. Under their four wall corners. And all we are saying every day is, uh, God is going to bless you, sinner. We need people who are going to speak to government. We need people who are going to speak to the media. We need people who are going to declare, Thus saith the Lord. Elijah shut the heaven and it disappeared. Guess what happened? Three years afterwards, he shows up. Elijah shows up. And it was so bad. You know, you know, as a man of God, we have power over the sun. <laughs> Go and ask Joshua. We have power over the elements. He says, all power in heaven and earth has been given unto me. And he says, I'm giving it to you. You know, we can force a nation to their knees. That was exactly what Elijah did. We can force national crisis and they will take notice of us. That was what Elijah did. You know, today, we, we sugarcoat our preaching. <laughs> you know, I always tell people, I tell pastors, most of us, God is not happy with us because we, we are not speaking the way John the Baptist speak, spoke. We are not speaking the way Jesus, Jesus, Jesus called people sapient. You know, we are blessing people that are cursed. We are saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. What did he say? He said to him, he says, there will be rain. There will be abundance of rain. But before he did that, there was the Mount Carmel challenge. He said, Eha, call all the 450 prophets of Baal. Call all the 400 prophets of the grooves. That is 850. And next, you know the next thing? I saw it the other day. He says, call all Israel. Call everyone to Mount Carmel. 
And when they called everyone to Mount Carmel, you know what he said? He said, you guys, call on your God. And the God that answers by fire, let him be what? Let him be God. You know the first thing that the Bible says he did? I want to read for you to hear. In 1 Kings 18 verse number 30, this is the need of this hour. 1 Kings 18 30, And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Ladies and gentlemen, what we need today is to repair the altar of prayer that has been broken down. We need us to go back in our homes, in our churches, in our nation. It says, I, he repaired the altar of God that was broken down. And guess what happened? Elijah called down fire. And after calling down fire, he said, get hold of all these false prophets and kill them. Wipe them out. And after killing them, you know what the Bible says happened to everybody? This is where I'm going. So everybody bowed their faces before God. That's verse number 39, 1 Kings 18, 39. And when all the people saw it, when they saw fire, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord is God. That's the meaning of Elijah. <laughs> the Lord, he is God. That was a national revival. But, but how did the national revival take place? I'll take you back to the book of James again. You know what the book of James said? The book of James chapter 5. It says, Elijah was a man of like passion. What did he do? He prayed. The first thing that he did, you see, uh, the, what, that Elijah did was to pray. And the Bible says, he prayed again. He told his servant, he said, go and look. It's, it's going to rain. He says, I can't see anything. He said, go back the seventh time. Elijah cast himself with his head between his two legs. That's the position of a woman that wants to give up. What was he doing? He was praying. It was not just the mere prophetic word that brought the revival. It was prophetic word and declaration backed up with prayer, effectual, fervent, heartfelt prayer of the righteous man, avails more. You know when Moses was on top of the mountain? Yeah. As long as his hands were up, Israel won. What happens down is determined by what happens in the heavenly. If we win the battles in the heavenly, it will affect our nation. It will affect our media. It will affect the people. But once the hands of Moses dropped, Israel lost the battle. The reason why there's so much darkness in our nation today is because we have lost in the place of prayer. And God is calling us as individuals, you know, as families, as church. Let's go back to the altar of prayer. Prayer lifts things. Prayer changes things. And God is asking us, God is asking us as a people to begin to pray like never before. You know, I never want to end any episode without giving you, my audience, the opportunity of accepting Christ. I know you never turned in by mistake or by accident. God designed it. And if this is your first time of hearing the gospel, or you want Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior, bow your heads and say this prayer after me. Say, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I know that I am a sinner and I need a Savior. Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me all my sins. Be my Lord and my personal Savior. I promise you, I will serve you for the rest of my life. Thank you, Father, for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. God gave me a commission to preach the gospel, lead men and women to the Lord, and also to pray for the sick. If you're sick right now, Place your hands on the TV very quickly or put your hands on your body. I want to make a decree right now. Father, I pray for every sick person listening to me. I decree total healing. I cause sickness from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. I decree be healed in the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Thank you for watching me. Please. I'd like you to worship with us in any one of our services. And please write me. I look forward to hearing from you. May the Lord bless you. Bye-bye.